they can actually do some things E. coli cannot do. For example, they can differentiate in different cell types. Then also experts predict synthetic biology to play a role in the future of medicine, the clients of which happen to be mammals, <laughs> but mostly humans. So I guess that's probably a reason enough to work in mammalian cells. So in the next 10 minutes, I will try to show you how on-off switches can be used to construct networks that then act as volume control and toggle switches for gene expression, and how biologic gates can be constructed that are actually addressable by more than one small molecule input. Gene regulation systems in mammalian cells usually come in two flavors. The off-type systems consist of a transcriptional activator that activates gene expression from a minimal promoter. Now, if you add a small molecule input, in this case, the antibiotic pristinamycin, the transactivator is removed from its binding site and gene expression is abolished. So in Boolean terms, this could be considered a not gate. On the other hand, we have the on systems, which consist of a constitutive promoter which is repressed by a transcriptional repressor. If you add the antibiotic input, the repressor is removed from its binding site and gene expression starts. Crab, by the way, has nothing to do with Kramer. The black curve depicts a typical dose response curve of a not type antibiotic system. For sufficiently low amounts of antibiotic, you get full expression and for concentrations starting at a certain threshold, expression is suppressed to base levels. It's important to note here that this is not zero, but probably two to five percent of maximal expression. Now, in a clinical setting where you would want to titrate gene expression to a desired level, it would be possible to do so by choosing the right amount of antibiotic, for example, like 123 nanograms, but very small changes in antibiotic concentration would result in big changes in gene expression. So it would be much more user-friendly to operate in either of these two concentration spaces. To this end, we have constructed a network by placing three not-type uh, gates in series such that each transactivator would activate the expression of the next one, the last one then being responsible for the expression of the gene of interest, in this case, secreted alkaline phosphatase CEOP. Now, if this cascade is left uninterrupted, you obtain maximal expression. If we interrupt by tetracycline, then only basal amounts of ET transactivator are expressed, which then result in substantial amounts of PIT transactivator which activates the up expression to about 75 to 80 percent of maximal expression. If we interrupt the cascade by erythromycin, then basal amounts of PIT transactivator are expressed, and the resulting CEOP expression is about 30 percent. Finally, if we interrupt the cascade by pristinomycin, we get only basal reported gene expression. It's important to note here that we are operating well into the wide concentration space. So even fluctuations of up to 100% in antibiotic concentrations would not result in a change in the gene expression pattern of this system. In the next project, we did something inspired by Tim Gartner and Jim Collins. That is, you cannot see that, but actually we, we did the mammalian toggle switch by combining two on-type systems, that is, we have two promoters which each express the repressor needed to repress the other one. And this is bistable, as has, has been shown before. So if we add the antibiotic erythromycin, which is clinically licensed to be used in humans, then ECRAB no longer binds to this promoter. PIPCRAB express uh, repressor and the reporter gene are fully expressed. PIPCRAB then represses this promoter here, and ECRAB is no longer produced, so there's no need to add any more 
erythromycin. So this way you can induce a high CELP expression state. If you add pristinomycin, you induce a low CELP expression state. So we went on and established a stable cell line containing these two constructs. We would then induce the high and the low expression state for three days and then remove the antibiotics and as you can see the expression states remain stable for about three weeks. I think I went away then so probably it's, it's even beyond. We then went further on and encapsulated these stable cell lines and injected the capsules intraperitoneally into mice. We treated the mice with erythromycin and pristinomycin to induce the high and the low CELP expression state. And the uh, mice were then left untreated for about a week. And as you can see, it doesn't really matter whether you have a mouse or a cell culture bottle around your cells. The expression more or less remains stable upon withdrawal of the antibiotics. So the networks I've presented you so far were based on not and if gates, if you want, or on and off systems. But in the future, it might prove handy to have building blocks that are addressable by more than one input. So as an example, I show here a not if gate. You cannot see that. Which is uh, addressable by tetracycline, which controls the binding of a transactivator and erythromycin, which controls the binding of a repressor to, of this minimal promoter. If, both, but if you add no input with, at all, then both molecules bind and the action of the repressor actually prevails and there is not much expression. Now, if you remove the repressor by adding erythromycin, expression is activated. And whenever you add tetracycline to remove the transactivator, then expression is basically abolished to very low basal levels, it must be said. So to conclude, I have hopefully shown you that also in mammalian cells, switches can be used to construct small networks. And uh, the networks with more than one input might actually be used to construct some more complex networks in the future. The molecular volume control acts can be used to fine-tune gene expression in a user-friendly way by using different antibiotics rather than different concentrations of the same antibiotic to fine-tune gene expression. The toggle switch allows switching between two stable expression states by adding transient spikes of antibiotics. And finally, if you're interested, I've got a poster. It's number 28. I guess I should thank my PhD supervisor, Professor Martin Fussenecker at the ETH in Zurich, Switzerland, my lab technician apprentice, Cornelius Fischer, and my co-workers, Wilfried Weber, Alessandro Silvio Viretta, and Marita Udelbaba for help with gene regulation systems, computer models, and mice. And finally, I would like to thank the organizers for having me here, and I would like to thank you for your attention. Thank you. Okay, the floor is open for questions. Over here, where's the microphone? Just, just shout. <laughs> So, so, so the question was, how well did the bistable switch work at the single cell level? And I must say, I, I did not look at that because our focus is mainly, you know, gene therapy, medicine, and there you're simply not working on a single cell level, but you always have a huge population, so I couldn't answer that. But it's known that in mammalian systems, for example, for the TET system, 
you sometimes get mosaic effects. That is, if you increase the concentration of inducer, you just get more cells that are being switched on. So it might actually be the same for our system. Yeah, Tim? Do you have any ideas for uh, improving the, or reducing the basal expression and or improving the dynamic range of the toggle switch? Yeah, I do have some ideas. I think it's probably difficult to fiddle around with the repressor strength and operator size because whatever you do on one promoter usually influences the other promoter in a negative way. So probably the way to go might be to add uh, positive feedback by using a, a not if gate as I've shown before. But I don't know whether that works, must be said. Okay, other questions? We have one up here. It's, it's, it's hard to say that your, your toggle switch is a full toggle switch unless you can flip the same system both ways. Have you done any experiments or are you planning to do experiments where you add one drug, remove it, and then add the other one to show that the same system will be able to stay in both situations? Yeah, it works. It does. I just didn't have the time to show that. Oh, okay. But yeah, it works perfectly. It's, it takes probably two or three days to, to fully switch the toggle switch because the, I think the repressors are quite stable. So, but it works. We're working on a slower time scale anyway, so no, it, it does work. Yeah, so you're working with uh, mammalian cell culture, so uh, have you thought about using enhancers or insulators to uh, further increase your, regula your regula regulation? I have thought about that, but I don't think it's, it's uh, the lack of insulators that make the system only have a dynamic range of two. The thing is that the gene regulation systems I use, like the, the, tetras, uh, the erythromycin and the pristinomycin system, even in a perfect configuration, you know, constitutively expressed uh, repressor, you only would have a dynamic range of 10 to 15. So I think, I mean, you probably can't get any better than maybe five, I would say. Other questions? Okay, let's thank Biot again. And uh, we have a, and this will be delivered by Michael Elowitz at the California Institute of Technology. So, Michael, thank you. Here we are. Okay, so just like to say thanks for uh, inviting me. I'm really enjoying the meeting. Um, and what I wanted to talk about today was some some work that really grew out of synthetic biology experiments, and I think is actually. Uh, What's really happened in a way is that by doing a synthetic biology experiment, we were kind of forced actually to ask a just regular biology question. And so the work today in a way is going to be uh, just regular biology, but I think it's very much tuned, uh, geared towards and, and designed to uh, address questions that are important in synthetic biology. So basically the, the basic problem that I think we're confronting in biology is how to understand biological circuits. Okay, so these include the natural circuits that have evolved over billions of years, as well as the ones that we're creating in the lab right now, and we've heard a lot about today. Um, and the kinds of questions we want to ask about natural circuit designs, the ones that have evolved, is what is the logic behind them? Why are they designed the way they are, instead of some other way? And, and uh, a complementary question is really what other circuit designs are possible, and this is really part of the motivation for synthetic biology, is exploring not just what really happened, but what might have happened as well, is in a way to try and understand what the constraints are, what the design space is inside cells. And uh, we, to do these things, we really need to know how circuits actually operate in vivo. Um, the situation right now is that we have a lot of circuit diagrams that are, are understood. So there's a variety of techniques, from just sequencing organisms to uh, really examining in detail uh, the genomic scale protein-protein interactions, uh, binding site protein interactions, and so forth. And the result of that is we get lots of uh, maps. And the maps tell you which genes interact with which other genes, who regulates who, and so forth. And what 
those maps are very suggestive of circuit diagrams, and it's suggestive of the possibility that we ought to be able to really understand the logic of how the cell is wired together, why it's working really well. Um, but there's a lot of problems, and the problems are basically that you can't go directly from one of these large-scale maps to a real understanding uh, of, of how the circuit works, or even to a prediction of how it's going to behave in most cases. Um, part of the problem is, of course, these circuits are very complex. Uh, it's often true that the function of the circuit is really not clear, the actual biological function it's been selected for. Um, we generally don't know the parameters that characterize the biochemical interactions inside the cell or what the effective biochemical rules that operate inside the cell are. Um, and finally, uh, there's just in biology a huge amount of variability in, in many different ways uh, that contributes to a real difficulty in interpreting all this data. And so synthetic biology is really... Uh, a kind of modeling of natural genetic circuits. And I, I like to think of it as modeling circuits not with a computer or not on paper, but out of biological components. And that's, I think we probably all agree that that's uh, an important, useful step here. Okay, so I think what I wanted to focus on today really are these last two issues, some attempts to, to address problems that come up when you try and ask uh, about what is the biochemistry and the, and the parameters? What are these things like inside the cell? And how do you deal with variability in, in a cell? Okay. okay, so the reason we got into these questions was because when we started doing our own synthetic biology experiments, we found that we couldn't understand a lot of the behavior. Uh, in one case, we made a whole library of uh, various networks with different uh, topologies, and we found that many of the behaviors we got um, didn't make sense from the circuit diagrams that we knew about. Uh, in another case, we built a synthetic oscillator, and we found there was a lot of cell-to-cell -cell variability in its, in its operation. And we did, that also did not come directly out of the model that we had of how it might work. Um, and so we want to ask the question, how do simple genetic com components function inside cells? And so let me start with this observation that phenotypic variability is ubiquitous in biology. Here's just a sample of some E. coli cells expressing GFP. And you can see there's a variety of different levels. Uh, you also find variability just in the morphology of cells, in their response to drugs, uh, in the behavior of synthetic circuits. And so variability is all over the place. Um, and we'd like to know where it comes from. And one very fundamental place it might come from is just the stochasticity of the chemical reactions inside the cells. This was pointed out uh, a, a long time ago, uh, and it was really addressed in detail by McAdams and Arkin in the 90s uh, from a theoretical point of view. And the basic observation is just that the correct way to think about the behavior of a chemical system inside of a cell is not as a continuous differential equation, but really taking going back to the fundamentals, which is that you have probabilities for different reactions to occur. And so when you treat it correctly, um, this is, you just get uh, erratic trajectories. And this is probably most easily seen with a very simple network. So you can just imagine one molecule X being created at some constant rate K, degraded at another rate D, and in a continuous approximation, you'd expect this thing to increase exponentially to some constant value. But of course, if you simulate it, you, you realize that you get quite erratic trajectories. So the consequences of this for um, gene expression are quite, quite profound because uh, the, generally the copy number of any particular piece of DNA inside the cell can be quite low, maybe one or two copies. And so the regime you're in in terms of numbers can be small. Okay. And, by the way, I'm going to speak about our experimental work, and there's also been a, a variety of other papers that have been published uh, on this topic recently. Okay, so we wanted to ask, well, that's a nice possible explanation, but uh, it's hard to say really whether that's what's actually causing variation in the cells. Is that really what's responsible for the variation we see? And if so, how big of an effect is it anyway? Um, and so to, to, to ask that, we want to really ask this very specific question. How much of a cell's behavior is even in principle unpredictable? In other words, if the cell sets a, how, to what extent is the future behavior of the cell really not, uh, not in, in the, under the control of the cell? And we ask this with respect to gene expression, which of course is a very fundamental process and, and we use all the time in these synthetic networks. Um, now, of course, you have to ask, how could we ever possibly know if things are really stochastic inside the cell? That's the, that's the issue. And the reason that it would be hard to know is kind of, you can imagine from this slide, um, 
To say something is stochastic means that if you start the system, start two identical copies of the system in the same initial condition and put them in the same environment, that they would continue to, to uh, be correlated with one another, continue to do the same things in the future. That's what it would mean to be, sorry, that's what it means to be operating deterministically. And if they start doing things that are different from one another, that's a sign that there must be something stochastic going on inside the cell. And so the ideal experiment you'd like to do is you'd like to take two identi perfectly identical cells like this, where every little molecule is in exactly the same place, and you'd like to put them in an identical environment and wait for a certain amount of time and see if they're still identical. And if they're not, that would tell you that there is something important that's stochastic in the operation of the cell. Now, you can't do this experiment. This is the problem, because you can never prepare two uh, exactly identical cells. If you, even if you look at two cells right after they divide, you find lots and lots of differences between them. Okay. So this experiment is unfortunately impossible. So it seems like it would be very hard to say whether something's really stochastic or not. Um, so what we can do instead is we can do a much simpler experiment. And the idea of the simpler experiment is instead of taking two identical cells and putting them in the same environment, we can take two identical genes and put them in the same cell. Okay. So here the two identical genes are actually not perfectly identical. They're two different alleles of green fluorescent protein, one which I will color green and the other I'll color red, even though one is really CFP and the other is actually YFP. Um, so in this talk, if you have equal amounts of green and red, that gives you yellow. And so that's a convenient thing for what we're going to do. So the idea of the experiment is just that um, if the behavior of gene expression is deterministic, uh, then cells might vary, things might vary from cell to cell, you know, the amount of uh, all sorts of different components, uh, and that might affect the level of gene expression from cell to cell, but it would, ex ex it would affect it in the same way for both copies of the gene. So therefore, even though you might get variability from cell to cell, that variability would be correlated between these two copies, and every cell in the population would have equal amounts of red and green and therefore look yellow, even though the intensity might vary. Um, the opposite extreme is if all of the variability is really controlled by, is really due to stochastic effects. And in that case, these two things vary independently, and you would get a population of cells, some of which were red and some of which were green and some of which were yellow. So you get these two extreme types of behavior, and you can really see the difference, at least in principle. Okay. So we built strains of E. coli to kind of implement this experiment. And the idea of the strains was we take the chromosome of E. coli and we put a CFP gene on one side and the YFP gene on the other side. And we put them under equivalent promoters so that they should always be controlled the same way. <coughs> okay. And then we just take pictures of cells. So it's an extremely simple experiment. These are just a, this is just a phase contrast image of some E. coli cells. Here are the same cells uh, where you can look at the CFP fluorescence same cells with YFP, and if you go back and forth between these two uh, slides, you can see that some cells are brighter in one image and some are brighter in the other image. And that's just a sign that when you put them together, you in fact do have uh, the signature of noise, so of stochasticity, which is to say you have red cells, green cells. I think the color balance is a little odd here, but in, in this picture you should have red, green, and yellow cells that are mixed together. So, so how do we interpret this kind of data? Well, <laughs> All right. We interpret it with a microphone on. Okay. So we interpret it by plotting uh, the data this way. We just put a dot on a graph for each cell. And the x-axis, we put its CFP intensity. And on the y-axis, we put its YFP intensity. And now we have a very direct way of uh, quantitating how important noise is. Because if there was no intrinsic noise, if stochasticity were not important, all of these points would lie exactly along the diagonal line here, right? Because they would always be perfectly correlated. Uh, so the extent to which they vary perpendicular to that line is a measure of how significant stochasticity is inside the cell. Now, you also notice that this cloud of points is elongated along this diagonal a little bit more than it is uh, perpendicular to the diagonal. So if there was only in stochasticity that was causing uh, variation, then uh, this cloud would be circularly symmetric, right? Because, all the, because there would be no, no correlation between the two genes. So the extent to which it's stretched out along the diagonal more than it is perpendicular to the diagonal is a measure of something else, something else that's causing these genes to vary. And that's something else we call extrinsic noise. And so now we have these two components of noise that we can, we can separate. Intrinsic noise is the stuff that's happening locally at the level of the gene, right? All the things, all the stochastic effects of binding, uh, polymerizing, so forth, that are specific to one copy of the gene or the other. This is like shot noise. Uh, extrinsic noise are all the other things in the cell that are varying from cell to cell, but are kind of global to that cell and would ex affect any promoter in the cell the same way. Okay, so these two components are, are really, you, you can separate them. Um, 
One way to think about the two components physically is that these intrinsic things are happening at the level of the gene, like I said, and the extrinsic things can be things like, say, the level of a polymerase, the level of ribosomes, all of these concentrations in the cell that can vary, or even the local microenvironment outside the cell. That can also vary from cell to cell. Okay. Um, and of course, these two things are not totally independent because noise can propagate through a genetic circuit. So if you imagine a very simple circuit like A activates B, uh, then A itself might be intrinsically noisy. In other words, it might, there might be noise in its own expression. Uh, but since it affects B, B has its own intrinsic noise and B feels the, the variation in A. And so you get a kind of propagation effect where intrinsic noise in one component gives you, or extr gives you extrinsic noise in a second component. Okay. So this raises the question, of course, of how genetic circuits work uh, despite this effect. So when we look at our data, we actually, f the first thing we saw was that if you express the genes very highly, you can get rid of the intrinsic noise pretty much almost all the way. So you can cut it down to like 5%. So these cells are, you can see, are almost uniformly yellow, meaning they have equal amounts of both genes being expressed. And so in this situation, noise is not important. But this is a very unusual situation. This only occurs when you have extremely highly expressed genes. Yeah. Um, what, this is also kind of fun to watch as a movie. Um, and in that case, you can just see how this microcolony grows very, very uniformly, except for a couple of cells, one that kind of turns red and gets and dies. And, the other one turns green, and they seem to be kind of sick. If you, if you see the, that guy right there is red. Okay. Um, anyway, so a much more physiologically relevant situation is what happens when you cut down the expression to, to more reasonable levels. And when you do that, you, you start to see colors popping out, and you start to see the noise shooting up, both intrinsic and extrinsic. And so this is really much more characteristic of the situation you have normally in the cell. Okay. Um, and again, th this looks, you can see in a movie, looks, looks quite different. Um, I feel like the colors are not as uh, dramatic as they're supposed to be, but uh, there's a lot more color variation in this, in this uh, situation. Oops. Oh. Okay, can't st you can't stop them from growing, I guess, here. Okay. So, okay. <laughs> All right, so anyway, one thing you can do, of course, is just very continuously vary the level of expression in these genes, and you can, you can actually get a quite reasonable expression for how the intrinsic noise changes. This is actually quite very similar to what you expect. If you think of it like shot noise, you expect it to go down uh, like the square root of the expression level, and that's more or less what you get. Um, it, these green points that are hard to see actually are the extrinsic noise, and you can see those do something very curious, which is that they first go up and then go down again. And at first, we were very puzzled by that. Why is it that the extrinsic noise goes up and then goes down as you increase the induction level? And um, it turns out that this is actually a manifestation of this effect. In other words, we're, we're seeing the indirect effects of, act of the a level of regulation above the thing that we're looking at. In other words, there's variation in the, comp uh, in the gene LAC-I, which is regulating both of the purporter genes that we're looking at. So one way to think of that is that uh, if you imagine there's a distribution in the population of LAC-I, which is turning these things off, uh, and we're inducing it with IPTG, uh, then if you have very little IPTG, so very low expression, then most of the cells are in the same state as one another. They're all basically have more LAC-I than IPTG. Okay? And so the extrinsic noise would be low. If you go to high IPTG, again, most of them are in the same state. This time, they have more IPTG than LAC-I, but they're all similar to one another. And again, extrinsic noise is low. But in an intermediate value of IPTG, you can kind of bisect the population so that you get a lot of effective variability. You kind of amplify the variation that you're seeing in LAC-I. You kind of couple to it. And then you start to see this peak in extrinsic noise. So we're really seeing two different levels of noise in this system, even in this extremely simple system. OK, the other thing we wanted to know is, you know, how do mutations in the cell actually affect this noise phenotype? And one of the curious things is that if you delete rec A, just a particular gene, you can actually dramatically increase the noise at the same level of expression. And so what that told us is that there's a really uh, coupling between um, mutations in the genome and the levels of noise in the cell. Okay, so that suggests that noise levels are something that might be tuned or selected during evolution, possibly. Okay, so I'm going to go forward a little bit. And finally, I, I just want to say on the, that uh, there's actually a recent experiment where this type of approach has been used in yeast. This is from uh, Aaron O'Shea's lab at UCSF. And uh, they see actually uh, some, this is a picture of yeast cells, same basic color scheme. So you have red cells, green cells. And you can see right here directly that uh, there's quite a bit of uh, variation from cell to cell. And what they find actually is that the extrinsic effects, extrinsic noise source is generally dominant over the intrinsic noise. So extrinsic turns out to be much more important. Um, 
but the, the point is that you can actually analyze uh, noise in all sorts of different systems with this technique. Okay. So in terms of noise, we can now def have a way to operationally define it and separate it into these two components. We can measure it. Um, we can actually show that uh, intrinsic noise, the stochasticity at the level of expression of the gene, really is the dominant source of variation in gene expression uh, in some conditions. Uh, but of course, there's this extrinsic component, and that's substantial or often dominant. Um, and we, in this case, we can connect it to the fluctuations in the transcription factor that's regulating, uh, that's regulating the, the promoters we're looking at. But of course, there can be lots of other uh, effects that can cause extrinsic noise. And a, a really important question is, in general, what is the extrinsic variable? What is it that's varying from cell to cell? And we're tr that's something we're trying to find out. Um, okay. So in the second part of the talk, uh, I wanted to move on to uh, talk a little bit about how you connect this picture of noise to the dynamics that you might be interested in when you're asking about the behavior of a network. So how do we add regulation and dynamics to this picture? Okay. And so uh, the, general question, the general situation is you have a number of transcription factors that impinge on some target promoter, and somehow the level of expression of this gene is a function of the concentrations and states of these transcription factors. Right? And the simplest case, of course, is just to have a single transcription factor or a repressor. Okay, so ideally, what, the way we usually think about this when we model networks is we imagine that there's some regulation function that tells us the activity of the promoter as a function of the concentration of the repressor. And we usually model this, say, with Hill kinetics, or there's various different, different ways, but we imagine some nonlinear function that looks like this, and this is the basis for our modeling of networks. Okay, and so we want to ask the question, now that we know how important noise is, is this, is this picture really well-defined at the single cell level? Does this make any sense? Microphone trouble. Okay, so um, of course, and, and one reason, so the noise is an important reason why we, th we might think that this picture is wrong. And it's also true that uh, the biochemistry in the cell is, is uh, you know, we always have this mental picture of a well mixed, uh, well stirred, sm small but, you know, uniformly bag of enzymes kind of picture of the cell. And uh, this is kind of my model of the E. coli cell. Uh, and the important thing to realize is that inside it's a very dense, high protein environment. Uh, and some, some species have cheese in the periplasm in this case. Okay. So, so based on that, we really wanted to ask, what does this function actually look like at the level of the single cell? So here's the idea. Uh, we need a way to vary the repressor concentration and we'll monitor the promoter activity at the same time. So we built strains that look like this. These have a uh, inducible C1YFP fusion. So this is lambda repressor fused to yellow fluorescent protein. And this is turning off a, a PR promoter controlling cyan fluorescent protein. So now we, can, we should be able to uh, vary the level of the repressor and watch its effect on the uh, a target gene in, in real time. Okay. So here was the idea of the experiment. We'd like a way actually to vary this repressor concentration over log steps. I mean, that's what you would do if you were doing a normal experiment um, inside the cell. And it's a little hard to imagine how to do that. And finally, we realized that actually the simplest thing is to just let uh, let nature do the job for you. So when cells grow, they, they tend to do, grow exponentially because they're dividing, 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 2, 4, 8, 16, and so forth. And so what that means is that if you just turn off the expression of the gene at some point, it'll just dilute out as the cells grow. And it'll dilute out in, in uh, logarithmic steps. So if you, whoop, so if you imagine what would happen, you, could, you, would, you would, before the experiment starts, you would make a bunch of the repressor, let it dilute out exponentially, and then watch the turn on of the target gene like that. Okay. So can we really do that? I don't know. Here's how it looks. Um, so the red here is the repressor. And as time goes on, you'll see that this repressor is diluting out in the population. So it's not being created or destroyed. It's just diluting out. And then you start to see that uh, the green gene turns on. And you can already see that it turns on a little bit at different levels in different cells here in this, in this movie. So this is our raw data. Um, and one thing about movies is raw data is they require a lot of uh, an analysis, which is uh, to get data out, to get into some, something you can actually deal with. And so we developed a computer program that kind of in a semi-automated way allows us to go from these, uh, these, this movie data to something we can quantitate. So first we have a computer program that divides this image up into individual cells uh, and then tracks them over time. And so this is a family tree of a microcolony. So we can actually look at the statistics here of the division events and kind of uh, follow the whole, the whole family. You see these things that end here. These aren't death. These are cells that we stopped following for, for different reasons. Okay. okay, so then you can just spit out any particular lineage in this tree that you want and, and follow it. 
So when you do that and you look at the data, here's what it looks like. You get a staircase of repressor, first of all. So here the dark lines are a particular lineage that we've just pulled out to highlight. And then the dim lines are all the other cells of the microcolony. So in this particular case, you can see that you have these, this staircase. This is a log scale of repressor concentration. And you see the staircase goes boom, boom, boom. These are two-fold steps, right? Every time dilution, you know, division, 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 division. And you can see that here's the CFP. So these, these steps are flat at the beginning. And they're flat because the slope here tells you about the promoter activity. So the fact that they're flat means the promoter is not expressing anything. But then later on when this repressor concentration gets low, you see these, these, these steps start to... Uh, uh, become steep, and this slope then is the promoter activity. So from this picture, you can immediately go to a picture of what is the regulation function at this at this level, and you see that you get this. Um, this is a log log plot actually. So um, you see you get a lot of scatter, um, but and the scatter is real. So this isn't mo most of this is not measurement error. It's real. So this is kind of a combination. Here you're looking really at the noise and the production rate rather than the steady state protein level. Okay, um, and you'll, you'll notice here that we quantitate these things in real units. And so you might ask, well, how can we say from this kind of picture how many fluorescence units correspond to uh, how many protein molecules? And for that, we just took advantage of something that uh, kind of popped up spontaneously. And that is that when you looked at those two-fold steps, we asked, well, are they really, uh, is it really diluting by half or not quite? And in fact, if you look at the error, and how the, pro the repressor is segregating to the two daughter cells, you find that that error, in general, it's all over the place. But if you average it, you find that it increases with the square root of the amount of protein. So this is just what you would expect if each molecule in the parent cell was flipping a coin to decide which of the two daughters to go to. And that means that this fit actually gives you, you can fit this with one parameter, and that parameter is the fluorescence per molecule. So we end up with a very natural calibration. Even though we can't detect a single GFP molecule, we can calibrate in terms of single GFP molecules uh, without really doing any extra work. Okay. So when you do this, you can first look at the mean regulation function, and you can do it either with a wild type promoter or with a promoter that has a point mutation in it that lowers an affinity. And you can really see a substantial effect of that. Um, and of course, you can also ask, uh, about fluctuations of individual cells with respect to this regulation function. So if you follow one particular cell trajectory here, you can see that it, it kind of slowly fluctuates under the curve and then comes back over the curve later. And in fact, that slow fluctuation turns out to be very general. Uh, we find a, kind of a long correlation time if we analyze how rapidly uh, cells, uh, the expression rate fluctuates. So I've tried to show that here. Here, this green curve is a measure of the autocorrelation function of the intrinsic noise, which is just to say uh, how much the level of expression now of it intrinsically correlates with uh, the level of expression in you know, so many minutes from now. And what you can see is that these points are all basically zero. So the intrinsic noise is like a white noise process. Um, it's something that is uh, only correlated at, at uh, time zero. It's, oh, it has like a delta function for correlation. Okay, which is consistent to what we think it, with what we think is really its dominant cause, namely fluctuations in transcription. Uh, if we look at the extrinsic component, on the other hand, we see this long tail uh, in the autocorrelation function, and that's telling us that extrinsically the activity of uh, the promoter is fluctuating on a very long time scale, and the time scale here is, is around a cell cycle. Okay, so there's lots of reasons you might think the cell cycle would be uh, a reasonable time scale for, for things to vary. Any stable protein would fluctuate on that time scale. Okay. Um, and so if we sum all this up, we end up with a picture of what does the regulation function actually look like at the single cell level? Well, we have this kind of classical piece. We have this kind of mean curve. And then we have these two intrinsic and extrinsic components that we have to, have to kind of fold into it. And in fact, not only are these components coming from different sources, but they have really different characteristics. So you have these fast fluctuations that are giving you intrinsic noise, and you have slow fluctuations that are giving you extrinsic noise. And the question now is, is this picture sufficient to actually predict the behavior of a network built out of these components? Which is something I think we're in a position to ask. Okay. So just to summarize then, we have this gene regulation function, which is really the fundamental relationship, and it needs to be characterized at single cell level. And we now, I think, know how to represent it and how to hopefully use it to predict the behavior of a network. Um, we can look at the different time scales on which things fluctuate. Um, and I think one of the neat things here is that you can really do actual biochemistry inside the cell uh, just by watching movies, which I, I like. Yes, we're from, I'm from LA. So. Um, and 
anyway, and of course, this, this technique, I think, also you could use to really look at all sorts of different processes inside cells, basically any, any of these kind of interactions. So um, it's the kind of thing that I think we didn't, it's something we were forced to do by the problems we were having with synthetic biology. We're really forced to go back and ask questions about uh, how these things actually work. And so we've been trying to do that. Uh, at the same time, we've also been trying to go back up now to the, to the circuit level and, and really start going back and building some interesting circuits along the lines of what uh, some of the other, other people here are doing. Um, anyway, so, so finally, I just want to emphasize that I think it's very important with synthetic biology that um, one of the, to me, the great and most interesting things about synthetic biology, the most promising things, is really that synthetic biology is going to actually tell you something about biology. And um, for, for me, so far, every time we've done a synthetic biology experiment, we've ended up trying, with forced, to a, forced to ask ourselves about a real biology question. And what I hope is that uh, as the field develops that, you know, the biological questions will be very closely, and I think they will be, closely intertwined with the efforts to construct devices and so forth. Um, so I really want to thank a number of people. Um, the noise experiment, I told you the first half of the talk was a collaboration with Peter Swain, Eric Sigi, and Arnie Levine. Um, this gene regulation experiment was a collaboration with Nitsan Rosenfeld, uh, who's in Uri Alon's lab, and Peter Swain. Um, I'd like to thank Stan Leibler and Mike Surrett, and uh, also my, my new uh, lab at Caltech, which we're just uh, setting up now. So thanks very much. Questions? We've got one over here. Actually, Michael, while they're passing the uh, microphone, let me ask a question. I'm kind of puzzled by your your the white noise measurement that you got because that noise is transcriptionally dominated, but it is low pass filtered by the by the, the by the protein degradation. So how come you didn't see an exponential decay of your of your autocorrelation function based you, associated with that protein decay? Right. So that's the nice thing about this technique is normally you have to worry about protein degradation and you have to worry, you know, the time scale of, of folding and everything. Here we're looking directly at the total protein. There's no degradation. But because we're doing movies, we can do make a differential measurement between two time points. And so what the autocorrelation is not the autocorrelation of the protein level. It's the autocorrelation of the synthesis rate of the protein. So it's an autocorrelation okay. of the rate of production. So that's, that's what the movies allow us to do, is look at rates. OK, so you saw the direct white noise of synthesis. Yeah. Okay. And I should also say, of course, that we can't say it's perfectly a delta function. Obviously, right. it's not. But uh, our time resolution in that particular case was about eight minutes. So we can say that it you know, looks that way up to about eight minutes. But. So a question um, over here. Did you, did you compare your data to the in vitro experiments, the data you got from the single cell experiments? How, what is your feeling about the traditional biochemistry data versus this kind of data? So actually, uh, we were kind of pleasantly surprised that the order of magnitude you get for, say, the K, the KD, uh, the half maximal amount of, the, the amount of uh, repressor you need to half maximally uh, repress actually comes out pretty close to what you would expect, around 50 nanomolar, um, and, or 50 molecules per cell. And so it's, uh, you know, it doesn't see, didn't seem that wrong. I, it, was kind of, it was kind of nice. One thing, though, that you can't really get from the uh, in vitro data is the, the cooperativity in the curve. And that's always the parameter that we really care the most about because it's the one that affects, you know, whether it's toggle switches or oscillators, uh, the nonlinearity in this curve is always the, really the crucial parameter, or one, or one of the most crucial. So. Tom? I think you may have glossed yeah. over a slide in which uh, you talked about the, the rec A uh, effect. And I'm, I'm curious about uh, you know, why that occurs, what your theories are about why it occurs, and what the implications that might have in terms of what cells we want to use. OK, so rec A. Uh, a rec a, a deletion of rec a has many, many, many phenotypes in the cell because rec a is involved in lots of processes. Uh, we heard about SOS today uh, in, in Jim's talk. And in addition, it's involved in DNA repair. Uh, anyway, it's involved in lots of things. And so probably what we're seeing, um, actually one, I could, I could quickly show you a movie of what these rec a cells look like. And I think that's the most thing that's most relevant to your question. Um, let's just, I skipped this movie. Um, and what you can see here is this, these cells on the bottom. You see, this is a rec A minus colony. And look at those. They look horrible. See, they grow, they grow the filament. They turn green or red. So you see this noise phenotype. And you can see that they often die. They just stop growing. And you know it's not the conditions in the media, because these guys around them are perfectly happy. 
<laughs> so um, the, what we think is happening basically is Rec A is contributing to kind of genomic instability. Uh, and if there's a lesion in the DNA and that lesion cannot be repaired, then one replication fork gets blocked, whereas the other one can be replicated. And so you get this kind of uh, um, amplification of one side of the DNA and not the other. Um, and that's the hypothesis that we have. Okay, there's a question at the top. Oh, I'm sorry, we've got a microphone over here already. Uh, so in terms of your uh, chimeras, uh, the uh, C1 GFP, is there, uh, so are there, could there be maturation effects? I mean, does the repressor element become active in repression and dimerize with the same time scale that the, your fluorescent reporter element is reporting its concentration? Right, so there's two issues with maturation. The issue with the repressor is actually not a problem at all under these conditions because we basically make it at the beginning of the experiment and then we're just watching it dilute. Uh, we, we, you, know, you might worry about bleaching in that case. Uh, the, the issue with CFP, of course, the target gene, is that you might think that you're kind of time delayed a little bit because of the maturation of CFP. So we've measured that maturation rate, and even though the GFP maturation rate in other systems like yeast or mammalian cells tends to be kind of slow, uh, in bacteria we get a number of about five minutes for a half, half time. So it's, it's not totally negligible, but it's uh, almost negligible under, for our time resolution. Yeah. Okay, where's the microphone? Okay, up at the top. Do you find there, that there's evidence for, um, so you talk about the intrinsic noise in certain genes, if the genes encoding for these extrinsic factors like ribosomes and polymerases, do you find that there's any, um, maybe somehow does there cells have strategies for reducing the intrinsic noise on these extrinsic factors so that it doesn't propagate through the system? Is there any uh, evidence for that? For, for keeping them regulated? So there's, um, I think the, the important issue which you're addressing really is not, now we have to ask, what, not what is the noise in these test promoters that we've set up, but what is the noise in the context of the natural network, right? And the nice thing about this technique is you can go in and probe any parts of the, the real circuit that you want, the natural circuit, right? So you can put two colors after you know, any promoters and you can get correlations between different promoters. And so it's really actually kind of a general way to ask where is the noise showing up in the circuit and kind of diagnosing it the way you might take, uh, you know, your, your contacts on a voltmeter and, you know, put them in different places. Yeah. Okay. So where's the microphone? Okay, it's up here on the left, Michael. Um, have you tried putting the, the uh, over here? Where? Oh, okay, sorry. Have you tried putting the CFP and the YFP uh, in Operon together so you can try to separate translational noise from transcriptional noise? Um, we, we actually did try and do that. We got something that was unstable, so we sort of had to, that never got made um, or never got done. But we think that the dominant effect here is really transcription. And I think it's a very important point that it's really transcription that controls noise. Uh, and the reason for that is basically, and the reason we can see it experimentally is that uh, as we tune IPTG, that's the thing that tunes the intrinsic noise directly. And IPTG is really controlling the transcription rate. Um, also, theoretically, you just expect translation to be a weaker effect unless the translation rate gets to be very, very low. So for, as long as the translation rate is more than a few per mRNA, uh, it's more or less negligible, we, uh, theoretically. Yep. Okay, uh, we've got a microphone there, and then, and then we'll get this Michael. Um, you, you talked about uh, hi, up here. Yeah. You, t you, t you talked about selective tuning of the noise. Do, do you have in mind, or in any event, do you expect to see stochastic resonance effects to optimize transmission of a near threshold signal? Um, stochastic resonance effects in the natural network? You mean? Yeah, yeah. It's possible. I mean, it just depends. I mean, the question now is how do how do we analyze? the structure of the network with respect to its noise transmission properties. And, uh, I, I haven't seen an example of that myself, but I don't know. Okay, so last question. Yeah. Uh, you talk about evolution or selection, which operates on a population level, and as we saw in some of the movies, you get some of the cases where cells would die off, etc. Do you see selection in a population sharpening some of these distributions or biasing them one direction or the other? Uh, the noise distributions? Could, could you repeat so, the question? Okay, forward? so the question is basically, does selection influence uh, the noise distribution, I, I think, right? At the, the, at the population level. And uh, 
one thing I think that the RECA experiment was suggestive of is that there is a link between the genotype, which can be selected on, and this kind of noise phenotype, right? So you can think of the noisiness as a kind of very odd phenotype of, of, a, of a particular strain. And it's an odd phenotype because it's something that, to characterize it, you have to look at individual cells, but it's really a, a property not of any one individual cell, but of the population. It's a statistic. And uh, so the experiment it naturally suggests is to just treat this like any other phenotype and ask whether you can do genetics on it. And you can select for higher or lower amounts of noise. And so th this is something that we're trying to do. Uh, and we'll hopefully find out. Great. So let's thank Michael one more time. Okay, and the uh, last talk for this morning session is on um, tracking RNA dynamics in live E. coli cells, and this will be presented by Ido Golding from Princeton University. Okay. Put this here. working one two three yeah is this working okay uh, hi good morning um, so in the few minutes that I have I'm gonna tell you a little about how we track individual RNA molecules in E. coli cells and maybe a bit like microstock it's a bit off the mainstream of synthetic biology but I hope you, you find it interesting nonetheless um, so this work is done, oops, wrong button. This work is done together with Ted Cox in Princeton University at whose lab I'm currently post -talking. And, ooh, I want to make this go. Okay, so what you see here, just as a pre-talk pre example, are E. coli cells, of which you've, you've seen a lot in the recent days. And the bright spots uh, dancing around are individual messenger RNA molecules that we track in the live cells. So what we do in general is we track individual messenger RNA molecules, and we're able to really quantify their dynamics, the single molecule dynamics in the cell, and that includes the diffusion coefficient and the what you may call the spring constant of the, of the molecule. I'll, I'll explain that in a minute. And even in some cases, we're able to measure the chain elongation rate during transcription. Beyond the single molecule, we can also just count the molecules in the cell, and we can characterize the, the statistics of the RNA copy number under conditions of either repression, induction, or the kinetics of, of going from one to the other. So how we do that? just you know at the cartoon level what we have the first ingredient in our system is a fusion protein that we're making in the cell so this is like the coli cell and these are the fusion proteins so what I fuse is GFP to MS2 code protein MS2 is a is a protein that recognizes and binds to a specific uh, RNA sequence a specific RNA stem loop while being sort of completely oblivious to other RNA sequences and to DNA um, so when, of course, when I'm just making this fusion protein, what happened to my laser? Michael, you finished my laser. <laughs> um, so what happens when I just make, yeah, that's too big for me. Thanks. Uh, so not a, this is the right size. Okay, ooh, okay. So. What, uh, what happens when I'm just making this fusion protein is that I just get these molecules diffusing in the cell and what I have is just uniform fluorescence like you all know. On the other hand, when I'm making an RNA, when I'm making an RNA message to, it, to which are fused around 100 copies of the binding site, then I have around 100 GFPs falling on the molecule and on the microscope I see a bright spot. So that's, you know, at the cartoon level. And 
In the real world, so how do we see MS2 GFP tagged RNA molecules? So again, my, my RNA message is like almost everything else here is controlled by IPTG. So when I have no RNA made, I just get uniform green fluorescence of the cells. And when I induce by IPTG, I get spots. And moreover, how do I know that these are single molecules? So the first evidence is the intensity of each spot. I can, I can measure it and plot the histogram of intensities. And indeed, the average intensity is a little under 100 GFPs as compared to uh, we do an in vitro assay under the same conditions. And we do, well, I won't go into the, all the natural leaders, like, you know, 90% controls going around each, you know, each measurement. And we need to convince ourselves and, and, and other people that in we, indeed we're seeing single RNA molecules. But one of the main lines is that this, the main intensity of each spot is around 100 GFPs, which is what we expect from the way we constructed the system. And beyond that, the whole spectrum of behavior that we see from the spots corresponds not only um, qualitatively, but quantitatively to the known lifestyle and, and behaviors of the messenger RNA. And we'll see that in a second. So we trace, we can trace these individual molecules, and I'll show you just a few examples of their dynamics. So one of the typical behaviors that we see is a kind of um, motion around a, a localized motion around some mean, and this is just a typical movie. So we can quantify this movie by quantify this motion by just plotting a histogram of the locations of each of these RNA particles, and. Of course, our natural interpretation is that what we're seeing are the RNA molecules as there's, when they're still tethered to the DNA template. So in our case, the DNA template is an F plasmid, the location of which is known very accurately from previous studies. And indeed, when we look at the mean position of these spots, they correspond, again, in a nice quantitative way to the location of the F plasmid from which they're being made. While when we measure also the variance of their positions, again, it corresponds nicely to the parameters of a single-stranded RNA chain of the lengths that we have. So that's what I mean by the, the spring constant. Okay. So another typical kind of behavior that we see is just free diffusion of the molecules in the cell. So again, we can quantify that by just plotting the displacement squared versus the time interval. And you know if you get a straight line, that means you have diffusion. And you, indeed, we get a straight line all the way until the part where the widths of the cells become important, then you get a different slope. And from the slope, we can easily calculate the diffusion coefficient. And again, compare it to, the, to what is known. And actually, I think like the, the only previous study I know of really measuring diffusion coefficient inside the coli cell, I think was done by uh, Michael like 10 years ago or something like that. So we, we compare it to the little data that we have from then. And another example, this is more, a more rare event that we see, is we can sometimes actually follow the, the chain, the RNA, the tagged RNA chain itself, which is what you see here. And we can measure, for example, the contour lengths of this chain over, chain over time. And when we do that, what we see is indeed that the chain elongates, and even the elongation rate that we measure fits very nicely the known transcription rate in, in E. coli, and we've done that in, 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 a few, in a few cells. But, and so, you know, we do many more fun things, but since my time, did I even start my timer? Or it's automatic? I can't even read that. Two minutes. Two minutes left. Okay. Okay. So beyond the level of the looking at the individual molecules, we can just look at different cells and count the number of molecules in them. And then we could do a kind of, uh, well, you know, look at the variability between cells. And these are just two examples. So one of the things we can do is we can just plot a histogram of how many molecules we have per cell under, dif under different conditions. So for example, when we have repression of the promoter, you know, we can plot the histogram. So the red bars are the data and the green, uh, the red, I guess. The red stars are just a fit to a Poisson distribution. So under repression, and I've done that with many hundreds of cells, the distribution seems to be, looks like a Poisson distribution of the number of molecules. 
Whereas where we go into induction, so this, for example, is what I call partial induction. And this, this is what you get when you have, in, in our promoter case, plus IPTG minus arabinose sugar. And you get a nice bimodal distribution. So you have like maybe 30% of the cells have no molecules, while, but while the other two-thirds have uh, increasing number of molecules. And you know you can also quantify that. So these graphs are for a more, from a more primitive area where I still counted the points by, by hand. Now I sort of automate that so I can look at many more. And for example, I can plot the variance in the number of molecules versus the mean number of molecules. And this is just a graph where I store sort of all of my data over there. And for comparison, the blue line again is variance equal, equals mean, what you would have in a in a, in a Poisson case. So that's, uh, so this is just, you know, a few examples of the things we do with the system, and since I'm running out of time, I'll stop here. Thank you. Okay, questions? So, here we go. I'll speak loudly. Okay. Some numbers for the diffusion coefficient. It looked like it was well described by a traditional diffusion process. Right. And also, I guess Michael has mentioned this as well. One of the motivations Michael presented for trying to do these in vivo studies was that uh, the cell really is more like a burrito and not like a well mixed bag. Right. Is that is that really true? Given now what you've measured <laughs> on, on the time scales that. It, at which we're interested for, say, transcription translational processes. How bad an approximation is it to assume the cell is a well-mixed bag of enzymes? So, uh, yeah, so that's a good point. So e even in Michael's uh, original paper on measuring diffusion coefficients, I think their main, he, he'll be able to correct me, but I think the main conclusion was that just, just uh, describing the cell by having some, um, what's the word, eta, what, what's eta? Uh, uh, defining the resistance of the liquid to motion. Viscosity, sorry. <laughs> so just assigning one viscosity value to the cell is sort of inappropriate. So, and what, what we were more or less able to do is sort of compare our case, which is, so remember our particle, which is, our, which is RNA plus uh, GFP sitting on it, is more the si like the size of a ribosome than the size of a let's say a single protein like Michael was doing. But still, when you scale it, it does make sense. It, it does make sense. So, so it only means that our data go well with their data, which sort of said that there's no one viscosity you can describe. But, but whether it's a burrito or you know, something else, my, my ethnic food uh, specialty is you know, from a different region, so I, I'm not sure. <laughs> OK, we had a question in the back. And then we'll, then we'll get this going next. Okay, uh, Could you use your method for measuring the elongation rate to measure the degradation rate? Um, so that was one of our, one of my sort of dream graphs that I thought of was looking at the number of molecules going up, going down, going up, going down. And um, at least with the current, uh, current method, I think the problem is that my proteins are uh, slowing and inhibiting the degradation. So what, I, what I'm planning to use is use just an, a different variant of the binding site that has a more, more, more useful off rate. So I'll be able to hopefully do that. That's yeah, that's a good point. Okay, we have a question on your upper left over here. Upper left, oh, lower, sorry, left. lower left. Um, well, this is sort of related. So where in the RNA are you putting these hairpins? Because this has been done a lot in yeast and other mm -hmm. systems right. and to track where RNAs move. Right. And where you put the hairpins has a huge impact on the stability and the right. behavior of the RNA. Right. So by so now, I've, that's a good point. So by now, I've tried it in, in different places. And one example that I didn't have time to show, for example, is I can make, let's say, an RNA message that encodes a uh, red fluorescence protein. And downstream of it, I put the binding sites. And I can see that, indeed, when I have RNA messages, I also have the cells turning red. So I know that my message is being easily translated, for example. Um, as for the sort of precise effects on, on stability, I haven't looked at that yet. But I, but I have sort of moved my, my sites around and put 
specific protein coding regions that I see are working. So at least I know to that level that it's okay. So um, the binding sites are yeah they're downstream of the of the of the encoding sequence in in what I'm using currently. Yeah. Other questions? Ed, uh, here we go, Tom. Could you say just a few words about the uh, kind of equipment you're using to do this? Um, yeah. Um, so um, my microscope is a is a regular. It's a Nikon inverted uh, microscope with epifluorescence, and the objective is I, I play with a few. So most of these are with the six with a 60x, and the camera is a. Uh, is a Cascade 512. That's like a I don't know, I don't know if you know the specific model. So that's a it's a pretty good photon counting camera. I mean the quantum yield is like well if I believe them it's like 80 or 90 percent. So it's really you know it's a pretty good camera. But for seeing the spots they're you know they're they're easily visible with I won't say without a microscope but with you know <laughs> no but definitely without a camera as opposed to some other scenarios where you need to like integrate long times and stuff like that. There's no need for that. I do maybe 50 milliseconds. It's it's good. 100. There's no problem with that. I was curious what um, mathematical formalism you use to account for the existence of the container. So diffusion within a closed volume is obviously different. Yeah. Different. So so that's a good point. So what I do in, in I wonder if this came back. Yeah, it came back. So this graph. I mean, if I expect a straight line, then I of course do not assume anything about, like you say, the container. But I'm, I'm, I'm talking to a few other physicist friends who are still physicists, unlike, unlike me. And there, is a, there are sort of nice models for, like you say, like a, a particle in a container. And that becomes, I guess, more interesting when I look at this part of the curve, the later part of the curve, and even more later parts of the curve. Or if I look at, you know, like correlations and other, other measurables. So I haven't done anything with it yet, but I. I have people on the on the waiting list for them, <laughs> but you can bypass them if you're if you're fast. Okay, we got a question up, up here. Yeah. Related to the question that was just asked, this diffusion coefficient is hundred times smaller than what's been previously reported. In fact, in uh, eukaryotics and even Michael's work, I think it was five micron square per second. Right, but that's times smaller. You, you're at. I'm sorry. No, I mean, you're absolutely right. But that's, as I said, uh, Michael's experiment has a typical, let's say, one protein. And here, remember, what I have is an RNA chain, a long polymer, on which there are ar around 100 uh, GFP MS2 proteins. Okay? So, so the scaling, then you can ask, you know, will the polymer, like, s sliver or, you know, all the, all the standard protein mo motion, uh, you know, modes. Michael wants to... Uh, I was wondering if I could just make one comment. Yeah, which sure. is that I think one of the striking things here is that um, if you look at uh, just a lack Z GFP fusion, how that moves around, in fact, it seems to be almost stationary, and yet this is a much larger complex if it's really a ribosome, and, and it still diffuses at all. And I think that's really quite an amazing uh, result. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Yeah, so that maybe goes to, to Jeffrey's question that it's, you know, that viscosity is not the number we should be looking at, but that a, a good protein will, will, you know, a well-designed protein that's meant to diffuse around the cell will be, be built differently than something that's meant not to move around the cell. Yeah. Okay, so we've got one question here and one question here, so. I'm sure I can hear you, but. Uh, It's always a question when you make a modification this large, you're not looking, of course, at the native molecule. Uh, in your experiment, it occurs to me you might push the envelope by cutting down the number of stem loops and then somehow trying to extrapolate some of your results. Have you looked into that? Right. So, uh, so that's, a, that's a good point. So um, as was mentioned before, there were somewhat similar works done um, in yeast and flies. And the only time they sort of got close to seeing single molecules was when they had uh, 48 GFPs falling on the spot. And even then, I, I was talking to these guys, they, you know, they maybe saw one molecule in many hundreds of cells or, or something like that. So I did start from down and, and climbed up. And I can probably cut it in two and it will still be okay. 
because the optics is nice and the coli are small and everything. But I, I probably can't cut it, you know, I can give you fourfold, but that's my, that's my last offer. <laughs> Okay, so two questions. One, did you study the size dependence of this diffusion coefficient systematically? Because you may get some unusual effects that would tell you about the typical distance between the other molecules in the soup. And the second question is, it looks like your curve bends over at distances that are much smaller than the typical distance between the cell walls. Because this uh, is sigma squared, so it's... Yes. Uh, no, well, I think I disagree about the second point. Uh, but maybe I'm wrong. Uh, let's check the good phaser. Uh, so this uh, square is like, uh, I don't know, 0.5. What's the square root of 0.5? 0.7. 0 0.7, yeah. So uh, uh, a width of a cell is like a little under a micron under these conditions. So, you know, it depends what you, you know, what's, what's it coated with on the inside, you know, the, the burrito. So, but that, but that might be an interesting point. And your first point, I agree that if I had, for example, if I do it with a molecule half the size, quarter the size, etc., I might find the scaling, you know, that's what we always look for in physics. So the scaling would tell me, would tell me more. So that's sort of on my to-do list, but I'm, going to conferences instead of putting in the work, <laughs> in the lab working. Yeah. Um, Ro Roger, Roger Chen has a... Where, where is the... Yeah. yeah. Ro Roger Chen has a method um, where he can um, add an exogenous fluorescent tag um, to, and have it bind to a specific RNA sequence. He then introduces into RNA in mammalian cells. Yeah. Um, does it work in your system? Because that would probably cut down your problem with diffusion. Is this the one with uh, modified oligos that... Fine too. Is that the one, or I'm no? Um, yes, actually, yes. That that's right. Um, yeah. So I've uh, that was also on my on my list. Had this project uh, fail miserably, uh, which surprisingly it hadn't so far. So, so uh, from from sort of just uh, literature scanning, it might be very non-trivial to get the oligos in the coli cells and let them and them be stable there. But I wouldn't rule it out as a as a decent possibility. I mean, worth worth trying. Yeah, definitely. Quick question about the uh, the diffusion coefficient. Have you considered at all uh, interactions with the prokaryotic versions of actin and tubulin as um, being uh, you know affecting this diffusion coefficient? Yeah, that's a good point. And I, I've just seen a I forgot where it was a recent paper about all these uh, bacterial protein. I mean, actin and myosin analogs and all that. Um, well, the, the, bo the, the, the temporary bottom line is that it does look like diffusion. So, I mean, I would not have been surprised if I saw something that's completely, you know, subdiffusion, super diffusion. But the fact is we did get that. So, but I don't know, Michael, do you have any, any, any intuition about what, what, what it's like in there? <laughs> uh, this is what it's like. I think we're watching this. Yeah, so I don't, I don't have a better answer yet, but I, I definitely agree that it's a super interesting subject. So, yeah. Okay, other questions? Okay, good. Then, uh, then I think uh, we should thank all the speakers one more time. And uh, I guess we're breaking for lunch now, and I think they're serving bacterial burritos for lunch, so... <laughs> So welcome to the afternoon session. Uh, my name is Maya Said, and I'm one of the organizers uh, of this conference. It's always a challenge to start a session immediately after lunch, so I'll try to entertain you. And I'm sure uh, we have great speakers this afternoon. But before that, I have a couple of announcements, actually four of them. Uh, I just want to remind people that have travel grants to make sure that they turned in their receipts outside at the registration booth in order to get uh, uh, their money back. Uh, also, tomorrow, all students from all schools participating in the uh, summer synthetic biology competition will have lunch together. Uh, the leader will be Randy, so just find him tomorrow. Another announcement. So this is the first synthetic biology uh, conference that we organized, and hopefully there'll be more. So we have 
evaluation forms at the front of the door, and if you can just fill them up and return them either today or tomorrow at the registration booth, that would be great. Uh, constructive feedback or destructive would be highly appreciated. Uh, I would also like to announce that uh, thanks to the generosity of IEEE EMBS, we had a poster competition, hidden poster comp competition going on. And uh, uh, we had five distinguished uh, judges uh, from different schools, uh, all professors, so it's not the organizing committee judging the posters. And I'd like, uh, I'd like to announce uh, the poster winners. Uh, as the location of this conference, the monetary award is undisclosed, uh, <laughs> but will be sent to the uh, contributing author uh, mailing address. So. If, if you're one of the poster winners, just make sure we have your mailing address. Uh, you'll be happy with the, with the poster prize. Uh, so, so we have uh, uh, three posters. Uh, the third, the third uh, prize goes for post. So actually, if the contributing author is here, uh, please stand up when I, when I call your name so that we can recognize you. Uh, the third prize goes to poster number 44, contributed by Ling Chong Yu. Is Ling Chong here? <laughs> For the title of the poster is Program Population Control by Cell Cell Communication and Regulated Killing. The second prize goes uh, for poster number 23, contributed by Farron Isaacs. Is Farron here? I guess Jim will let Farron know. I can't see him. Uh, but uh, and for the title, a framework for post-transcriptional control of gene expression, engineered riboregulators based on cis repression and transactivation. The number one, the, the first poster prize goes for poster number 42, contributed by Yushi Wakamoto. Is Yushi here? For uh, measured by on chip sing, uh, phenomenological analysis of history of single cell dynamics. So, as announced yesterday, last night at the dinner, there will be another poster session today uh, at, from 6 to 7.30 p.m. with some refreshments. So, everybody is encouraged to go back and look at all the pos posters, including these ones. So, with these announcements, uh, I'll move on to today's uh, afternoon session. So we have two sets of two talks. Uh, the focus of the first two talks is on the problem of programming individual cells and extending that to complex populations of cells. So the question here is how can we program rich complex patterns using a cellular substrate? Uh, the question will be addressed from both the experimental and theoretical side by the first two talks. Then after the break, we'll, foc we'll look at a couple of uh, applications of synthetic biology specifically materials and chem chemical processing. So starting for the, with the first talk, it's my pleasure to introduce Ron Weiss from Princeton University, who will be talking on engineered uh, digital analog and transient behavior in individual cells and cell communities. Thank you. Uh, so before I get started, I just want to uh, mention that when I first started working on this in Tom Knight's lab, uh, I would always go to conferences and I would always feel like the outsider. And uh, so this is the first time I actually feel like an insider. And I'm trying to figure out if this is a good thing or a bad thing, but uh, we'll keep it at that for now. So uh, what are we doing? What am I going to talk about today? Uh, so we're trying to program cell communities. This is also, uh, you know, started from uh, the amorphous computing project that Jerry Sussman and Hal Abelson and Tom Knight were involved in. Uh, the question is, how do we actually get some kind of coherent behavior uh, in, this, in these environments? And so we've, we've looked at um, engineering components, and we've looked at engineering circuits, and we've looked at uh, then putting them together uh, to program cell communities. Uh, and the type of components that we're looking at are both digital and analog. So we think that you know, there's some notion here, is digital a good thing to do, uh, are cells analog, and so on. So the answer is yes. I mean, the answer is you want to do both digital behavior uh, when you want it, and the answer is that you want to do some analog behavior uh, when the right thing is uh, when the thing is required. 
Uh, so I'm going to spend about half of the talk on that in the beginning, and then I'm going to uh, talk about some of the cell-cell communication uh, systems that we've built uh, using some, um, some of these basic principles. So I'm going to talk about uh, controlling steady-state behavior. I'm going to talk about controlling dynamic behavior. And I'm going to also talk about uh, controlling spatial behavior. And you'll basically know the difference, because here I'm going to be talking about showing you curves. And once I get into the spatial behavior, I'll show you pictures. So you'll, get the, you'll know the difference. Um, so how, do, how did I get started? So when I got started in Tom Knight's lab uh, on this, the first thing I wanted to do was the simplest thing I could think of that would not be uh, sort of completely obvious. Uh, and that would be an inverter circuit. Okay? So this is an inverter circuit. We have 0 here um, as the input always, meaning that there's no regulation of lack i. Uh, and the idea is that um, based on the level of IPTG, we can either express, get expression of YFP or not. So when we have no IPTG in the system, uh, we have lack i represses the C1. Uh, and then we have expression of YFP because that's not being repressed. And then the other case is when we add IPTG to the system, that derepresses uh, the PLAC, and then we have C1 expression, we get no YFP. So, okay, this is simple enough. You should be able to get something that looks like this, uh, inverse sigmoidal curve, no problem. We'll build digital circuits. I thought I would then move on to building who knows what, the counters or I don't know what. Uh, but this is reality, right? Um, and so this hasn't... I mean, this hasn't been emphasized quite as much. There's been some talk of this. But the reality in our lab, I don't know how it is in other labs, is that every single circuit that we built always does not work. Okay? There's not a single one that we built that actually worked the first time. And so the great challenge, in my mind, is to try to understand how you can take something that looks like it should work and actually engineer it, tweak it, and so on, until you get the right behavior. Uh, so in this case, uh, after much frustration, we realized that the circuit that we built was actually designed to give you this behavior. Okay? And so we went back to the simulation tools and realized that uh, we can take a curve that basically looks flat and try to make it uh, inverse sigmoidal, like, uh, like what we desire. Uh, in this case, what we did is we simulated what would happen if we uh, modify the ribosome binding site of the C1 and actually reduce its efficiency. In fact, we went ahead and modified it uh, made some experimental systems, and we had three different curves, and this is, in fact, the uh, best curve that we got. So it looks like we can, in fact, start engineering the system towards uh, the behavior that we're looking for. And we said, okay, this looks good. Let's try to uh, keep moving, keep engineering it. Uh, so we simulated, uh, for example, reducing the binding affinity of C1 to the lambda promoter here by modifying the operators. And the answer was that, so we made some mutations to the operator, and we are, in fact, able to uh, engineer a few more curves. This is the best one that we got. We actually got some curves that we're not able to completely repress the system. So the point is that we can you know, start doing something like rational design. These were uh, semi-quantitative simulations that did not match exactly uh, what we had in the cells, but they were able to give us hints as to what we might want to try. Uh, and since then, we've been doing things like global sensitivity analysis to try to figure out where are the best knobs to tweak in the system so that we get uh, the optimized behavior. Now, in addition to this, in addition to this rational de design, um, I was also involved with a project with Frances Arnold and her postdoc, Yohei Yokobayashi, where we used directed evolution in order to take the same flat circuit or the, the same flat response and try to evolve it to get something that actually gives us the right behavior. And so here are some experimental curves that we got, and it looks like this is an alternative approach to trying to, to get the same kind of response in the system. So again, I think in this context, is rational design the right answer? Is directed evolution the right answer? And I think it's a combination. Uh, where I stand in the spectrum is that I think we should be designing circuits using a rational approach until we get to a point where we're fairly close to what we think should work. Okay, So use some kind of... Uh, rational design where the connectivity looks okay, and then potentially employ evolution techniques to get us past that last hurdle to get to the uh, optimized behavior. Uh, one of the things about the circuit is that uh, in the directed evolution is that it discovered mutations that we couldn't necessarily rationally design at this point. So here I'm showing you uh, where the mutations that were discovered that were actually able uh, to give us the right behavior in the dimerization domain and DNA binding domain. And at this point, we don't have the techniques. Maybe Homie can actually uh, enlighten us about this. But we don't have the techniques to try to figure out uh, 
from uh, amino acid sequence to this kind of function, uh, how to go about doing that. Where we, whereas we do have techniques for certain other characteristics of the system, maybe ribosome binding site efficiency, translation, I mean, transcription efficiencies, and so on. Okay, so then we said, okay, we can engineer something lo that looks like an inverter, uh, starting from some uh, potentially bad circuits. Can we actually take this and can we, in fact, build more complex logic, more complex digital logic? So we start with a circuit that looks like this, and this is a simple circuit where we add ATC to the system, and then we observe uh, an increase in the YFP levels. And we wanted to ask the question, if we're going to add these noisy components to the system, what happens? Does the system get worse? Does the system get better? Does it stay about the same? Uh, and this is relevant when you're trying to think about engineering large systems. So we talk about counters. So how many elements do, do we need to actually implement counters? How many uh, components in series or you know, multiplexing together and so on are we going to need? And are these systems going to completely become non-functional uh, because of the noise in the system? So what we did is we added uh, the circuit that I showed you before. We added basically two more uh, components of repression to try to analyze what happens to this particular system. Uh, and again, this is the first response that we got. And so this looks OK. Uh, this looks like it's uh, got an increased gain in the system in the transition from low to high. But for some reason, we're not getting, getting the kind of basal expression that we really think is needed uh, for doing more complex digital logic. Uh, so we went ahead and you know, thought about this. And we said, OK, maybe if we uh, reduce so I increase the binding affinity here of the lambda promoter to give it back its original uh, binding affinity. And we went ahead and synthesized that. And in fact, we were able to get a response that looks pretty digital. So whether you think that cells are analog or you think they're digital or whatever, uh, I think the, the hope is that we can, in fact, build systems that have fairly good digital behavior. So here, we see that you know a, a factor of about two in the um, increase in the inducer molecule gives us almost 800 to 1,000-fold factor uh, in the output. So that's, you know, that's pretty reasonable digital behavior. Uh, in fact, it, we have a hard time even getting points in between this transition because it's so tight. Is it too digital? I don't know. Um, so what does this look like when we look at the population statistics? Uh, so we, here we have increases in the level of inducer in the first circuit versus the YFP intensity. And we see that we have uh, a fairly uniform increase uh, as we increase the level of ATC in terms of the YFP intensity. But the distribution looks kind of about the same as we move along this curve. Uh, what happens when we make the circuit uh, with the additional two repressors? What we get here uh, is this kind of response where it's flat and the distribution looks reasonably tight. Uh, and then we have this intermediate region where we have basically huge, bi huge bifurcation uh, in the diversity of, of the population. And this, is, I think, is fairly obvious when you think about the system as a signal amplifier where you're exactly in this range where just a little bit more of a molecule is going to cause you to shift completely over to the high state or completely over to the low state. So this, I think, is kind of expected, even though our, our, you know, now we're working on uh, the models that can really show us uh, this kind of behavior. So another question to ask, okay, so we think that we can build digital behavior. Uh, we want to understand what is the dynamic behavior of the system. Uh, in this case, what we're showing is that uh, here we have the circuit one, the uh, less complex circuit. We show that it has a fairly immediate response. And then as we add the two components, we get a delay in the system. So in fact, you see uh, things like this. Uri Alon, for example, had a very nice uh, paper talking about delays, and Mike Savage uh, we talked about this before, uh, showing delays in the system. Uh, and these could be useful uh, for things like uh, development, for things like uh, wanting to introduce uh, delays you know, for a variety of reasons, uh, sequencing, re uh, sequencing of activities uh, within the, this context. So then we ask the question, are there additional things about this dynamic behavior that are interesting? Uh, one thing we noticed, and we did some simulations and we tried some experiments, is that the larger system is actually uh, less responsive to fluctuations in the input. So what we did is we gave this a five-minute pulse. And then we asked the question, what, how is the system responding to this? So when we gave this a, a five-minute pulse, what we saw is that the first circuit actually responds, where the, uh, the more complex circuit 
is able to essentially filter out that kind of noisy input, if you'd like. And so we did this for a, long, uh, a variety of longer uh, input pulses. And again, we were able to verify that we have some kind of a transition uh, where as we increase the input uh, duration, we see more and more response uh, in both circuits. Okay? So the point is that we th uh, the longer transcriptional cascades are able to actually filter out what you might call as input noise. So in some sense, they're kind of acting as low-pass fil uh, low filter devices. Okay? Something else about the circuit uh, that we thought was interesting uh, is the ability to actually modify the dynamic behavior uh, in other ways. And so here we're looking, well you can modify, you can take this circuit, for example, and modify its dynamic behavior with a variety of mechanisms. One of them might be to uh, modify the decay rates of the protein. Okay? We looked at another mechanism where we wanted to, for example, increase the delay in the system. So what we did is we basically decreased the affinity of the lac I to the lac promoter. And the way we did that is by adding IPTG into the system. So as you decrease the affinity of lac I, it basically takes it more time to reach the high levels that allow it to repress the lac promoter and therefore basically stop the uh, expression of the lambda repressor. So that causes, so when you increase the input from low to high, that causes an increase in the, in the delay of the system because it takes it longer basically to, for lac I to reach the levels that are necessary to get C1 to go down. So we can, we can, in fact, tune these dynamic parameters. So we can tune both the steady state behavior of the system as well as the uh, dynamic behavior of the system. You'll also notice that uh, when you go back, when you go from high input to low uh, input, you get basically the reverse effect in the system. So it kind of makes sense. OK, so we, we looked at uh, individual cells. We think that we can uh, employ some design techniques to get us where we want, uh, rational design, directed evolution. We can engineer the steady state dynamic behavior of the system. And we think that digital circuits are, in fact, plausible. Uh, but what we're really interested in, or what we're also interested in, is programming a vast number of cells. OK, so when we got started, I got, I got started in this. Uh, we wanted to first implement cell-cell communication sort of in this programmatic way. So in this case, what we did is we implemented uh, sender cells and receiver cells. And these are using uh, the quorum sensing elements. And the idea is that you can increase this inducer level and then cause the expression of the lux I protein, which makes this quorum sensing molecule, which will then diffuse into its neighbors. Whenever it enters its neighbors, it's going to activate expression of the GFP promoter. So this is a simple mechanism for controlling cell-cell communication. So if you like to uh, look at genetic circuits, you can look here. Uh, if you like to look at logic circuits, uh, this might be easier for you to understand. Uh, but this is a fairly simple circuit. And so with the help of Nick Papadakis, uh, I made this uh, movie where we place sender cells uh, as droplets. So here are the sender cells. And we place receiver cells just to verify that, in fact, we get this controlled uh, communication happening. And you see that as time goes by, you get this basic, you basically get this gradient um, of communication. So the cells that are nearby are fluorescing first, and then eventually everybody is going to respond to that signal. Okay, and we did uh, multiple experiments. We put uh, smaller droplets, and we put, uh, we did this in uh, environments where you have smaller microcolonies, and we in fact see this gradient of communication. Okay, so we said to ourselves, okay, that wasn't too bad. That actually was. I think that was the one experiment that actually worked at, uh, sort of the first time. Uh, so we, then we asked the question, uh, can we do something more interesting? Uh, and so in fact, when I was, so I teach this class called Logic Design. Some of my students are over here. And when I was getting ready for a lecture about pulse generators, I actually noticed that, oh, we can in fact make this kind of circuit in bacteria. So I talked to uh, my student, and Subayu is here. Uh, and we talked about this, and they said, OK, we can do this. This is not going to be too hard. Uh, so this is the logic circuit for this pulse generator. Uh, and this is the genetic circuit for this pulse generator. And so I'll talk about how this works in a second. So if you're a genetic engineer, you probably want to think about this as a feed-forward design. And if you're a computer engineer, you think about this as having a race condition. Okay? So the idea with a race condition is that this circuit should always give you a zero output. Okay? But whenever you introduce an input to the system, 
you get this static zero hazard, which means that the output is going to be low, then it's going to rise, and then it's going to go back down again. So how does something like this work? Well, uh, again, we're going to have these sender cells. These are the same sender cells as before. Uh, introduce ATC into the system. They make the, the Luxi. We get the uh, homocerin lactin over here. Uh, that will diffuse into this pulse generator cells. And we get activation uh, of, two diff of two promoters. And we initially get GFP expressed from this promoter over here. And then we get a slower expression of the lambda repressor, which eventually reaches the levels where it's actually repressing uh, this promoter over here, and the GFP goes away. OK, so we're able to see some kind of pulse response. And here's a simulation of the pulse response where uh, we see an initial rise in GFP. And then as a result of having the lambda repressor levels go up, eventually it uh, represses the GFP production, and that goes away. OK, so here's a movie of this. Uh, of this situation, so we put sender cells over here. And as opposed to before, where we saw basically an increase in the level of GFP everywhere, what we see here uh, is an initial increase, and then we see an ultimate decrease in the level. You also notice that you know, clearly there's noise in the system. So this, you know, this might be something that Michael Elowitz wants to look at. Uh, we've certainly looked at this, and we've graphed uh, the behavior of the individual cells. Uh, and it's quite interesting. Uh, another thing that you'll notice here is that the cells that are near the senders actually end up fluorescing for a longer amount of time. And so I'll, I'll get back to that in a second. Uh, we also, in constructing this circuit, we again, we like to tweak things. Okay? So we engineered a variety of different circuits. Again, uh, the blue curve here represents our initial effort. So this is, in fact, in chronological order. And um, these represent improved and improved uh, efforts in doing this, and we are now also using, trying to use directed evolution techniques to uh, get improved pulses. And this is, and again, in collaboration with Francis Arnold. Uh, here's a model of the system where we're trying uh, to look at pulse gain. So try to optimize pulse gain. Pulse gain is basically the difference between the maximum GFP that can we, we can obtain and the ultimate GFP uh, in the system, the final GFP. And so what you see here is there's some kind of a sweet spot uh, when you modify the lambda repressor translation efficiency and you modify uh, the repressor binding efficiency. So you really want to shoot at somewhere in the middle here. So now, do we know where we are? We don't know where we are. We know that we are, uh, before we are basically completely uh, repressing the system over here, and we're able to sh uh, actually move towards this direction. So we're not quite sure uh, where we are in the system. And we, in fact, are hoping to get there uh, by uh, trying to uh, have a better representation, a better model that is able to capture uh, this kind of behavior that we're looking at. Uh, so what, what else are we doing with the system? Something else that is more common in nature is rather than seeing step functions, uh, typically what you're going to see are more of gradual increases. Okay, So you know, it's not that common, I think, to see step functions in, uh, in biology. So what does this circuit do? When you modify the, uh, the rate at which you increase the input, but you have the same final input concentration. Okay? And so here we have experimental results and simulation results. So there's reasonable uh, qualitative correspondence here. And the idea is that as you uh, decrease the rate at which you, uh, the input signal goes up, the response is both delayed and diminished. Okay, and so these are the experimental results, the simulation results. And basically, in some sense, if you want to, you know, it depends on your, on your view and how optimistic you are uh, or how lenient you are with definitions, uh, these cells are in some sense sort of computing the first derivative uh, of the system. So they're basically looking not at the final level of the input, but rather the, at the rate at which the input is rising. Okay, so this might be useful. Uh, we found it to actually be useful in a spatiotemporal context. And so here what we did is we had sender cells over here, and we placed receiver cells all over the place. And then we noticed that uh, the receiver cells that were closer to the sender cells had a response, whereas the receiver cells that are far, again, we have some noise in the system, obviously. Uh, but the receiver cells that are farther away completely ignore the signal, as opposed to the situation that we saw before, that all the receiver cells ended up uh, fluorescing. 
So this is, in fact, giving us, by, by doing this kind of engineering, giving us some ability to do signal processing beyond what, what the normal sort of chemical diffusion is giving us. So we might be able to, to engineer systems that have very fine control over spatial resolution, despite the fact that they're working with signals that are not, that are not very fine because of chemical diffusion and so on. Okay? And so we develop some, a model of the system, so the model looks reasonable, again, in these uh, unitless distances and so on. Uh, and here uh, is the actual experimental results, so, so some the reasonable correlation between the fact that as, when you're really close to the senders, you have a pulse response, and when you're far away from the senders, even though you get the signal, you actually end up completely ignoring that signal. Okay, so we want to continue moving on with, uh, with this and try to understand uh, how can we possibly form things like patterns, spatial temporal patterns or steady state patterns. So this is an example where we want to form some kind of a bullseye uh, pattern. So we're going to start with sender cells. And so I don't know if Eric Eisenstadt is here, but uh, so we can, in fact, propose to, to detect, for example, uh, the source of toxins. So they can tell us, OK, you have some toxins in the, in the environment, and the level in the middle is highest. And as you get further and further away from the source of the toxin, uh, basically the level of the uh, chemical goes down. So can we engineer circuits that can actually tell us, OK, this is where the toxins are? So we think this has applications in sort of biosensing uh, environments and other kinds of applications where patterning uh, might be useful, whether it's tissue engineering, uh, fabrication, or so on. Uh, so what's the idea here? The idea is that we're going to build a circuit that has this kind of band detect response. Okay? And the idea is that uh, when you have low levels of the input, uh, you have no response. You have high level, uh, medium levels, you have a response. And then when you have high levels again, uh, you have no response. And so when we do this in computer simulations, we can basically modify this uh, range of detection to any level that we want, or any kind of width that we want, at least in the simulations. Uh, so how does the system work? So I'll uh, briefly go over that. How am I doing on time, by the way? OK. Uh, so I will actually finish on time. Um, so how does the circuit actually work? Well, we have the senders uh, as we did before. And then we have these band detector cells. And the idea is that when you have no communication between the senders and the receivers, uh, you have no activation of, of these two uh, proteins. And then you have uh, this lack I is actually repressing the GFP output. When we have a medium level of communication between them, we have activation uh, of these two proteins. Uh, the lambda repressor repre is expressed at sufficient concentrations so as to repress the lack I. And then this lack I is expressed at lower levels and we have uh, GFP expression. And then once we go to the situation where we have high levels of expression, we have activation of these two uh, proteins. And this lack I over here is actually able to repress uh, the output protein. Okay, So we went ahead, uh, or Subayo went ahead, and uh, synthesized the circuit. And we get this kind of response. Uh, and so this was done in liquid phase. And the idea here, again, is that no, no uh, low input, we get no output. Medium input, we get high output. And then uh, high input, we get low output. And so when we put this on a, uh, in a Petri dish, and we put the sender cells here in the middle, OK? And then we place droplets of the rec identical receiver cells all over the uh, Petri dish. Uh, after waiting about 14 hours, uh, we get this kind of response. OK, so if, you, if everybody squints their eyes, they'll see some kind of a ring formation over here. Okay? And so the idea is that cells that are near the senders are not fluorescing. Cells that are uh, about medium length distance away from the senders are fluorescing. And then once you get further away, they don't fluoresce. And so we believe that we can, in fact, engineer different responses. So for example, get like a red fluorescent response over here by modifying uh, the characteristics of the circuit. And then, in fact, get us close to the situation where we get some kind of a bullseye pattern. Okay. So what else can you do with this kind of band detect capability? Well, you can start playing games. Okay. Uh, and so here, everybody here has heard about Conway's Game of Life. Okay, so basic idea. So by the way, I didn't realize that there's such a cult following for this. There's, I think, in fact, like a monthly newsletter that comes out about Conway's Game of Life. You type that on the web, you get 
hundreds of thousands of hits, uh, and everybody has implemented this, and so on. Everybody comes up with really cool patterns. Uh, so basic idea is that you have simple local rules that lead to complex uh, global behavior. And so if you have, uh, in this grid, if you have uh, just the right number of neighbors who survive or, you're, or you give birth to additional uh, elements, and then if you have too many neighbors, you die from overpopulation. Uh, if you have too few neighbors, you die because you're lonely. Okay? Uh, so I don't know if that part is really, I mean, does that really correspond to something? I guess so. Um, but uh, interesting thing about it is the global behavior and some characteristics about it, whether given some arbitrary pattern, whether this will ever terminate uh, is provably unpredictable. So we thought this would be an interesting thing to experiment with. Uh, so you go on the web and you pirate somebody else's uh, code, um, and then you actually play around with this for two days until you snap out of it. <laughs> <laughs> and then you find one that's, that's simple, that conveys the message that patterns can, in fact, interesting patterns can actually uh, form. And so you have, have gliders and shooters and so on. Um, and then you go ahead, and this is after the fact, after synthesizing it. And by the way, let me point out that Ling Chung uh, poster in a recent paper, he implemented a nice system for population control, which is uh, essentially the high threshold component of this. Uh, so he's, he's working again with Francis Arnold. He's going to be going to Duke. He's doing very good work. Uh, so we went ahead and implemented uh, the entire system where we have the high threshold component where, um, and we have the low threshold component. And the idea is that when you have very low levels of communication or qu essentially quorum sensing between these uh, cells, then uh, you have no, re this doesn't get expressed, this E protein here which kills the cell doesn't get expressed, uh, but this doesn't get expressed as, as well. This is the lambda repressor and you have cell death you, uh, due to this E protein. Intermediate levels, you get repression of this E protein as well, reactivation of this one, and then high level you get activation of this uh, protein over here. And so then you go ahead and you observe this under a microscope. Um, and so I guess this is what you see. At some point, we're going to add some sound effects to this, I guess. Uh, but you basically see cells growing and dividing and then dying. So, um, so some kind of interesting patterns. And I think you know, this is you know, also you can get captured uh, with this as well. But these t take much longer to do than these simulations. Uh, so why are we doing this, besides the fact that we think it's fun? Uh, well, I think there's some science to be understood from this as well. I don't know what the real practical applications. There might be, this might be the killer app, I guess. Uh, <laughs> but, uh, so let me try to move. Oh, okay, so we went ahead and did some simulations of this. Uh, and this is using, so, you know, these are cells, for those of you that don't know what these are. Uh, and so we're modeling each cell. We're modeling uh, the genetic circuits as, uh, with stochastic equations. Uh, we're modeling cell growth um, and division. And then uh, we have diffusion of the chemical. And you see basically all kinds of interesting patterns that form. And you see here the levels uh, of the quorum sensing molecule. Interesting thing about this is that every time you do this from identical conditions, you're going to get very different patterns. Okay? So, uh, you're going to get these kinds of patterns. Every time you do this, you'll, you'll get uh, patterns. So is this circuit you know, some kind of a noise amplifier? Uh, I don't know. We'll try to find out. Can we, and another important question, is that even if we had perfect knowledge of the system, could we predict what the, what the system outcome will be? So we think it's, a, it's important both to understand what kind of systems you can engineer that have this digital response that I started talking about in, in the beginning that had this digital response where every time you build a system, it's going to give you an identical, identical response. And can you engineer simple systems that basically, you know, you can't say anything sort of too intelligent about, or you can try to say something intelligent about, which is I don't know what's going to happen. Uh, so we want to understand sort of what are the limits in terms of uh, what we can predict in these kinds of systems. So. Uh, just to summarize, we've engineered some uh, digital analog devices. Uh, we think we can implement digital logic uh, with a variety of uh, different techniques. Uh, we really want to understand how to build interesting spatiotemporal uh, control for pattern formation and also understand. So this is, there's two types here. One of them is trying to think about 
engineering specific systems with specific goals in mind. And another type of uh, be, um, focus is trying to understand what happens when you have these simple local rules, what kind of behavior will emerge out of these uh, local rules. And clearly, as everybody here knows, a uh, variety of challenges and opportunities in this field. So uh, I will stop here. So we'll take questions. There's one there. Stop it up. Uh, hey, Ron. Do you think that uh, your larger cells are responding more strongly to a VAI in the distance effect experiment? Do you, which experiment? The pulse generator experiment? No, no, no. Just which the one? distance effect. The larger cells? Yeah, physically larger. Um, well, we're not real sure. Uh, in your picture, does it? In, in it the looks picture, like well, so it might be the case that there's more. You know, we haven't analyzed whether whether size here matters. So what you know, what implications that has for you know the promoter copy number, uh, whether you have more sensitivities, whether you have more leaky expression, and so on. So I think I think that's an interesting question. The the answer is I don't know yet. So we can find out. There's so your oh. yeah your spatial your spatio your spatial temporal system looks a lot like the reaction diffusion type patterns that, that were classically used in development of biology and it's also a right. research topic in in mathematics so which which can generate very complex behavior and yeah. also very defined complex behavior as well so it seems to me that your vision here is that you might use something like that if you're interested in circuits of, of, uh, of complex circuits is to use that to set up the pattern of the circuit and then switch over say to the digital side to 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 then implement various logic is that where you were going with some of your vision for this yeah I mean I think we can uh, you know certainly we get inspired I mean uh, we we try to get inspired but what people have done in cellular automata you know clearly the stuff that's going on in amorphous computing uh, you know just a huge literature that's available out there for doing you know uh, Turing patterns, you know, polka dots uh, was part of the IP. And so, you know, just tremendous amount of things that we can explore. Uh, the question is, you know, what happens when you actually implement these things in, in living organisms? What kind of changes? Uh, you know, I think in the game of life, for example, we notice that, you know, noise plays a huge role. And I don't know if, uh, you know, we haven't been able to find noise as one of the elements in, you know, all these game of life simulations. And I, I mean, I searched for some time, couldn't find it. There might, if, anybody knows about it, but certainly in living systems that p plays a huge role and what does that mean as far as what can be predicted? Uh, Turing patterns, so if you take Turing patterns, add notions of noise and so on, you know, what happens? Are these, uh, you know, stripes, are they really going to form? Are they going to be permanent? Are they going to, you know, turn, the stripes are going to turn into polka dots and so on? Uh, it'll be interesting to see what happens. So this is kind of, let's see what happens kind of approach as opposed to let's try to get it to work, which is sometimes nice. Um, uh, despite one more there, oh. up there. Oh yeah, despite the noise in your game of life uh, setup, I was just wondering if there, if you get some average, you know, uh, if you take the distances between the living cells, whether there's some average distance between them, so that each cell is experiencing some mid-level of right. the quorum sensing mo of the right. quorum molecule. Uh, we haven't quite seen that yet. Uh, one, let me point out that the work that uh, Ling Chang was doing that if you take. Um, just the high threshold component of the system and you put it uh, within just liquid media where you have essentially instantaneous diffusion, then rather than being this incredibly noisy um, system, it becomes a very stable system, incredibly stable system, despite the fact that you have regulated uh, cell killing. And in fact, he's, able, he's been able to show that you can put these in chemostats and you know, over, I don't know how many, three, you know, more than 300 hours, several weeks, the population is able to maintain a very steady level, despite the fact that you have, you know, mutation and evolution as uh, forces that try to, will try to drive the system away from that. Uh, so, in fact, w one other thing that's interesting about that system is the fact that um, there you actually need noise in order for the system to work, right? So, the fact that if the cells were all digital and the cells were all behaving in the exact, all had the exact same response, what would happen is the population would grow and then it would reach this threshold 
level of uh, HSL, and then everybody would die. Right? So you actually need the cells to have variety between them in order for that system to basically sort of oscillate uh, at that level. Uh, how does that, you know, so to get back to your question, how does that correspond to uh, introducing something that has, uh, you know, diffusion as a real component in the system, uh, whether you get these kind of domains uh, or not, you know, that remains to be seen. So hopefully we'll have the answer to that soon. So we'll, we'll take one last question here. Hi, Ron. Beautiful word. Um, if you uh, put one diffuser inhibitor on one side, put another diffuser promoters on the other side, what would you expect to see? Because that's a real life situation. You mean, you mean like predator prey? Yes. Okay, I can't talk about that. But uh, <laughs> I think Ling Chang just exited the room. But uh, yeah, you would, you would expect to see some kind of predator prey behavior um, that would be very interesting. So hopefully we'll, uh, we'll have some you know, real results on that showing uh, some kind of you know, population oscillations and so on. And, you know, that's an incredibly fascinating system. Yeah. Okay, let's thank Ron again. Thank you. So our, our next speaker this afternoon is Radhika Nagpal from Harvard Medical School uh, talking about amorphous computing, pattern formation, and silico.